Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 3 of the short Banana Wars series. The Banana Wars were a series of US invasions slash interventions in Latin America during the early 20th century. This series is meant to give a little insight as to what occurred during these events that in many ways have impacted the citizens of these nations until modern day. In today's episode, we will be looking at the US occupation of Nicaragua. In 1909, Nicaraguan President Jose Santos Zelaya of the Liberal Party faced opposition from the Conservative Party led by Governor Juan Jose Estrada, who ended up receiving support from the US government. The United States had limited military presence in the nation, having only one patrolling naval ship off the coast. The Conservative Party sought to overthrow Zelaya, which led to Estrada's rebellion in December of 1909. Two Americans were captured and indicted for allegedly joining the rebellion and laying down mines. Zelaya ordered the execution of the two Americans, which heavily severed U.S. relations. Forces under Juan Estrada and various other commanders led a conservative revolt against Zelaya's government. They captured three small towns on the border with Costa Rica, and they were inciting an open rebellion in the capital. Zelaya resigned on December the 14th of 1909 due to American pressure, and his handpicked successor, Jose Madriz, was elected by unanimous vote of the National Assembly on the 20th. The U.S. Secretary of State Philander C. Cox stated that the United States would not resume diplomatic relations. By mid-March of 1909, the insurgency led by Esrada was seemingly collapsed, and with the apparent and unexpected strength of Madriz, the U.S. withdrew its naval forces. However, Madrid was unable to restore order, and he resigned on August the 20th of 1910, resulting in Esrada rising to power. Esrada's administration allowed U.S. President William Howard Taft to apply the dollar diplomacy, with the stated goal to undermine European financial strength in the region and to protect American private investment in the extraction of natural resources. The policy opened the door for American banks to lend money to the Nicaraguan government, ensuring U.S. control over the country's finances. Political differences between the two parties in the nation soon surfaced once again, and Minister of War General Luis Mena forced Esrada to resign. Esrada's vice president, the conservative Alfredo Diaz, then became president. Diaz's connection with the United States led to a decline in his popularity. Nationalistic sentiment arose in the military, including Luis Mena again. Mena managed to gain the support of the National Assembly, accused Diaz of selling out the nation, and called for his resignation. Diaz asked the U.S. government for help as Mena's opposition turned into rebellion. In mid-1912, Mena persuaded the National Assembly to name him successor when Diaz's term expired. When the United States refused to recognize the Assembly's decision, Mena rebelled against the Diaz government. Diaz, relying on the U.S. government's traditional support of the government, made clear that he would not guarantee the safety of U.S. persons and property in Nicaragua and requested U.S. intervention. In the first two weeks of August of 1912, Mena and his forces captured steamers that were owned by railroad companies that were managed by U.S. interests. Insurgents attacked the capital, subjugating it to a four-hour bombard. In September, 100 U.S. Marines arrived shortly reinforced by 350 Marines, and the commander of the American forces was Admiral William Henry Hudson Sutherland. My god, what a name. Him himself joined by Colonel Joseph Henry Pendleton and 750 more Marines. The main goal was securing the railroad from Coronento to the capital. The United States kept a contingent force in Nicaragua almost continually from 1912 until 1933. Although it was reduced to 100 in 1913, the contingent served as a reminder of the willingness of the United States to use force and its desire to keep the conservative government in power. Under the United States supervision, national elections were held in 1913, but the Liberals refused to participate in the election, and Alfredo Diaz was re-elected to a full term. Foreign investment decreased during this period because of the high levels of violence and political instability. Nicaragua and the United States signed but never ratified the Castile-Knox Treaty in 1914, 
giving the US the right to intervene in the nation to protect US interests. A modified version, the Camaro O'Brien Treaty, omitted the intervention clause, but was finally ratified by the United States Senate in 1916. This treaty gave the US exclusive rights to build an inter-oceanic canal across Nicaragua. Because the US had already built the Panama Canal, the terms of the treaty served the primary purpose of securing US interests against political foreign countries, mainly that being Germany or Japan, building another canal in Central America. The treaty also transformed Nicaragua into a United States protectorate. Collaboration with the US allowed the conservatives to remain in power until 1925. The liberals boycott the 1916 election, and conservative Emiliano Camaro was elected with no opposition. The liberals did participate in the 1920s election, but the backing of the US and the Front election put Diego Manuel Camaro to the chair. The late 20s and early 30s saw the growing power of Aniasto Somanza Garcia, a leader who would create a dynasty that ruled Nicaragua for four and a half decades. In the United States, popular opposition to the intervention rose as the casualty list grew. Anxious to withdraw from the nation's politics, the U.S. turned over command of the National Guard to the Nicaraguan government, and the U.S. Marines left the country soon afterward.